There you go. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Emily. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name uh, is Archie, um, and I will obviously I will very miss all of you, um, but what I won't miss is telling you that I'm the Ministry Associate with Responsibility for Community Outreach Work here at Portobello Baptist Church, because uh, it's just a bit of a mouthful, really, actually, isn't it? Um, anyway, um, I'm actually feeling quite hot this morning, so sorry, if you just let me take off my uh, coat. That's right. Oh, oh, there we go. Wow. Right. Oh, yeah. Now... Um, if you're new here this morning, or if you weren't here last week, that would have been very weird for you. Um, I don't normally wear salmon pink shirts. I've got nothing, in theory, against them. Uh, this was given to me uh, very kindly as a leaving gift by you all, so, so thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, I, the Tuesday group that, who meet in the cafe on a Tuesday, uh, really, I feel like they bullied me into wearing it this morning. Uh, <laughs> But also I thought, well, I need to stay in the church's good books uh, because I might need a reference from you in the future. Uh, so, yeah, that's... There we go. It's kind of the same color as my skin if I were to get some sun and be sunburned. So you might just be seeing a black thing uh, if you're on Zoom. Um, hello to you if you're on Zoom. Um, when Glenn asked me to preach this morning, uh, he said that I could preach on anything that I wanted uh, apart from the Bible, uh, which I'll admit uh, it didn't seem very Christian. Uh, what he meant by this was just don't continue uh, our sermon series that we've been doing called Storylines, which is about the Bible. Um, so if you were coming expecting uh, part four of that sermon series, then I, I'm very sorry to disappoint you, um, but I'd be delighted to welcome you back next week uh, for that. Um, I decided actually, Glenn said uh, don't preach about the Bible. I decided actually I probably should preach on something in the Bible. Um, and so once I decided that I would preach on something in the Bible, uh, choosing what to preach on when you can preach on anything is quite a reflective process. And, and so I got to, it's a terrifying process as well. It's, um, once I got over the initial kind of inertia of, oh, what do I say? It's a, the Bible's a big book. Um, but I got to ask myself questions like, well, what is God saying to me right now? And what might God want to say uh, to Portobello Baptist Church this week? Uh, so something that I have been thinking a lot about recently uh, is the role of the Holy Spirit in the lives of individual believers and in the life of the church. Um, seeing as uh, last Sunday was Pentecost, and then this Sunday uh, we're losing our community outreach worker, uh, I thought that perhaps the end of Luke's gospel would be a good place to kind of roughly base the sermon. Uh, so thank you, Emily, uh, for reading. Um, I'd like to um, particularly talk about what I've come to realize, uh, which is this. The Holy Spirit is the community outreach worker that we didn't know we needed. Perhaps you already know this. Perhaps you're like, well, that's obvious. Of, of course we need the Holy Spirit. And, and probably lots of you already know this because you're very clever people. You're very spiritual people. But it's something that I need to keep on reminding myself of, and it's something that the disciples certainly didn't know until Pentecost. The Holy Spirit is quite simply the best community outreach worker that you will find. It is the Holy Spirit who empowers us to live like Jesus, to point to Jesus, and to be the best community outreach workers that we can possibly be. Now, I realize um, that if we're going to start uh, talking about the Holy Spirit as the community outreach worker that we didn't know that we needed, um, th that's also a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? Um, but anyway, we're going to have to ask ourselves, well, what is the Holy Spirit? Uh, and careful listeners uh, will actually notice that I have just misspoken, because our question is not what is the Holy Spirit, but who is the Holy Spirit? I have to be honest with you, uh, it's infuriatingly difficult to say. The Holy Spirit is the third person within the one God, i.e. the third member of the Trinity. And I feel like that's important to say. I think you, you have to say that. Um, but I also feel that because the Trinity is confusing and because talking about it can be quite formulaic, we should probably say a little bit more. We often use metaphors to talk about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is breath, wind, water, fire, oil, a hand, a seal, a dove, the community outreach worker we didn't know that we needed. Um, and actually, I realize as I've listed a hand, a seal, a dove, 
I realize that with a hand being a living thing and a dove being a living thing, it might be confusing me talking about a seal. The Holy Spirit is not like a seal, like a big blubbery mass that you might find on the beach. I mean, the kind of seal that um, seals things. Um, yeah, I can only think of like the seal that you get when you open your pasta and you don't use all of it and you have to, but I don't think that's really what the biblical writers meant. Um, but actually, it's, this confusion is helpful because it, 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 it demonstrates that metaphors can be illustrative, they can be very helpful, but they're also limited and they can be confusing. I think that one of the reasons why the Holy Spirit is so difficult to describe and to talk about is the Holy Spirit is incredibly self-effacing. The Holy Spirit doesn't draw attention to the Holy Spirit's self. Rather, the, the Holy Spirit is continually pointing us to God the Father and to Jesus his Son. He's is jumping up and down. He's waving his hands. He's shouting, hey, have you, look over here. Have you seen how great God is? And, and oh, yes. Jesus, have you met Jesus? Have you seen how brilliant he is? What glories our God can do? The, the Holy Spirit points to God the Father and Jesus his Son. But if we were to ignore all of this pointing and, and focus in on the Holy Spirit, what might we be able to say? I think we'd probably be able to say that the third person of the one God gives life. And that the third person of the one God is God present amongst us. Uh, there's a, a British pastor and theologian, he's called Simon Ponsonby. Uh, he's got a, a wonderful West Country accent. So I would encourage you, like, search out a Simon from Simon Ponsonby. Not because what he has to say is good, but what he has to say is good. But such a nice accent. Um, anyway, I'm not even going to bother trying to replicate it. He's got a book about the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's called God Inside Out. It's a, actually a really good book. It's concise, it's engaging, uh, but it's very clear and is useful. Um, you can tell that it's a good book because it's got uh, two covers, which means it's been reprinted. Uh, so it's got one from 2007, which you can buy for about £3.50, including postage and packaging online. And then this fancier one with a more up-to-date cover, which probably costs like a tenner. Um, anyway... He says this, The Spirit is eternal, personal, powerful God. The Lord the Spirit is able to see and to save. The Spirit is God outgoing, outreaching, outstretching to us in love. The Spirit is not a vague, distant, abstract, incommunicable force field, but divine Lord and personal lover. All of this, I think, qualifies the Holy Spirit as a pretty good community outreach worker, wouldn't you say? But you wouldn't say, you didn't say, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Okay, you can if you want, it doesn't matter. Because <laughs> what you might also say is, hang on a second, good sir, because perhaps the Holy Spirit is a good outreach worker, but, but the best outreach worker Surely Jesus was the greatest community outreach worker ever, and, and hey, you're right, he was. You'd be an idiot to not admit that Jesus was a pretty good outreach worker. But let me also say this. The work that Jesus did, the incredible, the miraculous work that Jesus did, was done through the power of the Holy Spirit. Not everyone thought this, mind you. Some people in Jesus' day, if you can actually believe it, accused Jesus of doing his miracles by the power of Beelzebul, the ruler of demons. And Jesus' response to them is helpful to us. He says, well, obviously I'm not powered by demons because I'm casting out demons. And, and why would a demon cast out demons? Instead, it's by the finger of God that I cast out demons. And if it's by the finger of God that I cast out demons that the kingdom of God has come upon you. The finger of God is a metaphor uh, for the Spirit of God. And so Jesus is basically saying, I do miracles by the Spirit of God, and if I do miracles by the Spirit of God, which I do, then the kingdom of God, the presence of God, has come near to you. The Catholic Church, uh, they, they've got a catechism, which is a book of teachings and what the Catholic Church believes in. Uh, it's quite good, and they say this. When the Father sends his word, he always sends his breath. I think that's quite cool. 
I also hope that it gives us hope. Jesus tells us that after his death and resurrection, he will ascend to the Father. And when he has ascended, Jesus says that he will send us his Holy Spirit, which means that whilst we may never be community outreach workers quite on the same level as Jesus, and whilst we try, we won't, the same Spirit who partnered with and empowered Jesus will also partner with and empower us. As we attempt to follow Jesus, we are aided and abetted uh, in our discipleship by the Holy Spirit. God has poured the Spirit out on us, and, and with Jesus, this Spirit, he shares the title of community, greatest community outreach worker ever. And so we are left to ask ourselves, well, what is it that makes the community, the Holy Spirit, such a good community outreach worker? And if you don't mind, uh, I'd like to answer this with a list, because everyone loves lists, especially on Sunday mornings. Lists are great. Um, but I have to admit, um, this list that I have for you this morning isn't the greatest of lists, because there's definitely stuff that's missing. Uh, the thing is, uh, I have a master's to start in September, and if I were to have made the list as comprehensive as it should be, uh, I probably would have missed my first semester, and we wouldn't want that. I do think, though, that uh, we'll manage to discuss seven ways in which the Holy Spirit does its role as community outreach worker, and I'll say that woven throughout the list is a sneaky bonus point for you, uh, which is this, that the Holy Spirit stirs worship. Encouraging creation to worship, it permeates everything the Spirit does, pointing to God the Father and Jesus his Son and saying, are they not glorious? My hope uh, with this sermon is absolutely to say that, yeah, God is good. We should worship him, so please do that if you like. But my hope is also to say, kind of in the, the style of like a classic rom-com line, like, go to him. Go to God, partner with him, see what can happen when we join God on his mission and team up with his spirit. It's hard, it's not easy, but it's a wild and worthwhile ride, and I think it's the best way to live. And so, uh, speaking of living and life, uh, the first thing that the spirit does is to breathe life. God's spirit was a taming wind in the beginning, hovering over holding back the dark void of uncreation. And as God spoke creation into order, his breath worked alongside his word to fashion beauty out of chaos. Later on in Genesis chapter 2, God does something which, I'll be honest, is a little bit strange, but he's God, so he can get away with it, I think. And he breathes life into us. That's not the strange part. Well, actually, that is a bit of a strange part, isn't it? He breathes life into us through our nostrils, which maybe that's, maybe I'm the only one who finds that weird. Perhaps that's not weird. Just as an aside, I do think that the fact that God breathes life into us through our nostrils is a really good reason not to pick our noses, because they're holy vessels. Um, but anyway, God, he breathes life. And if you know the story, uh, or if you're familiar with that pretty terrible human tendency to mess things up, then you'll know that we actually, we start to do far worse than just pick our noses. We were made in God's image, we were filled with life, we were shaped to his likeness, and then we went and spoiled it all by saying something stupid like, yeah, I'll eat that apple. We disobeyed God. We loved ourselves more than others. We cracked the image of God and we were chucked out of Eden. And I guess you could say, if you wanted to, that because of our sin, we as a people were reduced to nothing but a bunch of dry bones, trapped in a valley, masquerading as the people of God, but in reality dry, broken, empty of life. And actually, it's funny that I should say that, because um, have you heard of the prophet Ezekiel? Ezekiel was a weird, really weird guy. He was an ancient Israelite prophet, and he records in the 37th chapter of his book a uh, kind of an interactive vision that he had, kind of like a, a virtual reality prophetic experience, if you like. And 
the hand of the Lord, he takes Ezekiel to a valley of dry bones. And then God asks him, human, can these bones live? Can these bones live? The, these are a bunch of old bones left to rot in a, a valley. They are us in our sin. And can they live? Oh boy, can they live. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause my breath to enter you and you shall live. I will put my breath in you and you shall live. And you shall know that I am Lord. If this sounds familiar uh, to the first creation, it should. The bones start to rattle, the four winds begin to blow, the nostrils start to inflate, and slowly but surely, new life comes to a vast multitude. We have this life in Christ Jesus. God's Spirit breathes life, and more importantly still, God's Spirit breathes new life. So what else does the Spirit do? God's Spirit sets us free. I don't know uh, what darkness clouds your life at the moment. I don't know which temptations might lie at your door. I, I don't know what evils of the present age assault you. But I do know this. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set us free from the law of sin and death. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And it has always been this way. It has always been this way. We mentioned earlier how Jesus drove demons out by the finger of God. And would you be interested to know that way back in Exodus chapter 8, it was the finger of God at work delivering Israel. God's Spirit liberated the Israelites from Egyptian oppressors. God's Spirit still today liberates us from sin and darkness. Whenever the blind now see, whenever the lame now walk, whenever lepers are cleansed, the deaf now hear, the dead are raised, and the poor hear good news, then this is the community outreach work of God's holy, healing, liberating Spirit. God's Spirit sets us free from sin and evil so that we are free for loving, healthy relationships with God, with others, with ourselves, and with the world around us. In this sense, uh, the liberating work of the Spirit is, is intimately bound up with uh, the way that the Spirit demands justice. If we do not love our neighbors as ourselves, then whatever else we do means nothing. However enthusiastically we worship, whatever uh, great sermons we might preach, whatever miracles we perform, if we do not love others as ourselves, however religious-looking we seem, it doesn't matter. There was a, a sheep enthusiast from ancient Israel uh, called Amos. Um, and actually, he was a sheep enthusiast. I don't know if he was a sheep enthusiast. His profession was dealing with sheep. He might have hated sheep and been very unenthusiastic about them. Um, but that doesn't matter. He's a shepherd from ancient Israel. He was also a prophet. Um, and speaking as inspired by God, Amos says that the Lord says, I hate, I despise your religious festivals. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Although you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like a river and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. For a long time, uh, I think, the, the rolling and the flowing of this justice river has been disrupted. It, it, it's been disrupted by... Like, I guess, like, like evil demon beavers who've built up a dam to stop the flow of this justice river. Um, it's easier to blame, like, imaginary demon beavers than it is to admit that, that we're wicked and we've stopped the flow of justice. Justice has trickled in, in drips and drabs, and on the whole, the poor have stayed exploited and the vulnerable have remained voiceless. I don't think that it will surprise you that, that Jesus burst this metaphorical demon beaver dam. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus says, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, 
to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The Spirit of God anointed Jesus to do justice. And the Spirit-filled followers of Jesus initially actually did quite well at following Jesus in this. Surprisingly so. If you've read the Gospels before you read Acts, it's, it's a surprise. Um, it said in Acts chapter 4, the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul. Everything they owned was held in common, and there was not a needy person amongst them. And I would like to be very clear that I'm not saying that we need to be exactly like this. We don't need to go and uh, buy a farm and then live on it and share everything together. Or, and then if someone needs money from the farm, we don't have to sell a bit of the farm to give that money to them. But the idea that everyone had dignity, that everyone was well cared for, that the community gave of itself to serve others, this is something to strive towards, I think. This description of the spirit-filled, justice-embodying community, it comes at the end of Acts chapter 4. Uh, and just kind of as a note that I'm not going to touch on that much, if you think that the Holy Spirit is not serious about demanding justice, then just read on from Acts chapter 4, the beginning of Acts chapter 5, and, and see what happens to Ananias and Sapphira. Um, but we're not going to touch on that, because if we do, then you'd have lots of difficult questions for Glenn and Bell. Um, so we'll move on. A significant reason why the Spirit demands justice is because God's Holy Spirit binds broken hearts. We hear the psalmist's uh, soliloquy in Psalm 38, 34, verse 18, that how the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. And, and that's nice, I think. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. It's nice, but, but sometimes the devil, he rocks up with a, a boombox to play a rival song that challenges the psalm and that tries to persuade us that this is a lie, that it's a platitude, and that God does not actually care. So the question is, who do we listen to? The floaty harp music of the psalmist who promises God's comfort? Or the unseemly rock music? of the one who steals and deceives and destroys. I have to actually be honest, um, <laughs> I'd far rather listen to rock music than harp music. <laughs> uh, maybe you would as well. Um, so we'll drop the, that music part of the metaphor. And maybe it's better to see the devil as a roaring lion. He's prowling around, looking for someone to devour. And that's what Peter writes in, in 1 Peter chapter 5 anyway. And, and Peter, in the same chapter, uh, he encourages us to cast all your anxieties onto God because he cares for you. Keep alert. Resist the devil. You may suffer a little while, but, but the God of all grace has called you to glory in Christ, and he will restore you. He will support you, strengthen you, and establish you. Paul echoes this sentiment. He says, we boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The Holy Spirit is a gift of God who pours God's love into our hearts, who draws near in our weakness, who strengthens through our sufferings, who prays for us when the pain is too much for words. The Holy Spirit is a gift of God who makes the love and grace and mercy of our Father present to us each and every day. That's, that's good. That's good news. I would admit, um, though, and I'm very sorry, um, that I don't have a smooth transition from that last point to this next point. Uh, and maybe, maybe you're sat there thinking, oh, bless, he thought his previous transitions were smooth. <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm trying, all right? <laughs> I'm doing my best. <laughs> anyway, one of the other ways that the Holy Spirit does community outreach work is by inspiring imagination. The Spirit shows us what a world ruled by Jesus looks like. 
This inspired imagination is not new to God's people. Throughout all of history, God has been speaking to humans through dreams, visions, oracles, and more, challenging us to see the world another way, to see the world God's way. And previously, this inspired imagination, it was reserved for Israel's prophets. One of Israel's prophets, a a guy called Joe, no, not Joe, maybe, no, Joel, um, definitely not called Joel, Joe, Hang on, can I try that line again? (laughs) Um, One of Israel's prophets, a guy called Joel, maybe he was interested in sheep, maybe he wasn't, had this message from God to share. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And just so that we're clear, this is an absolute game changer. This opens the partnership with God's Spirit, the filling of God's Spirit to all people. And Pentecost saw the fulfillment of this prophecy. The Spirit swept its fire and wind onto those who would follow Jesus, and the Spirit continues to do so to this day. We're guided by the Spirit towards truth. We're shaped by the Spirit into a Jesus-shaped community. And we are inspired to see the world not as it is, but as it could be when God's kingdom comes upon it. The Bible finishes, actually, with a piece of inspired imagination. John, a veteran apostle who's exiled on the island of Patmos, he sees this vision of new creation and is absolutely just majestic, is marvelous. God dwells with his people. God's glory lights up the entire place. And so the question for us, I think, is, well, how can we see this heaven on earth today? How can we interpret John's vision of new creation for the 21st century? How can we see justice roll down like a river? How can we see righteousness like an ever-flowing stream? I don't really know. I need the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to see how we can spread God's blessing to all creation. But I'll admit, it's a a tough time to be trying to do that. We're told repeatedly that religion is dead and that the church's days are numbered. And do you know what? Maybe that's true. But the gospel is alive and thriving. God continues to care, Christ continues to save, the Spirit continues to transform lives and change communities. You can close church buildings, you can sideline theology, you can make fun of people for having faith, whatever, whatever you want to do. Here's the thing, you cannot stop the good news that sin has lost its sting because Christ is the risen King and he's coming back again. This good news, this gospel, it will not stop. It cannot stop. God will always breathe life. God will always set free. God always makes whole. And I pray that we will have the imagination, that that we'll have the eyes to see and, and the hands to do God's redeeming work in our communities. And if some of this imaginative stuff sounds exciting, I hope that that's because it is. But because it's exciting, it kind of makes it easy to, for, um, to forget that behind all of these kind of jaw-dropping bursts of grace, there's days, there's years, there's, there's even decades of normal Christians doing that very boring thing of loving God and loving others. It's not an exciting message, but I'm convinced that a Christ-like character is just as much a miracle as a sign or wonder. Here's where we see the the fruit of the Spirit come in. The Spirit molds us into the image of Christ. The holy part of the Holy Spirit is more than just a decoration to the title. The Spirit convicts us, guides us, corrects us, teaches us, and reminds us the way of Jesus. When we obey God, when we abide in Him, when we love one another then sometimes only with 20 mile an hour progress and and sometimes in fits and starts, we're sculpted into Christ's likeness. As this happens, 
the world slowly changes. Blessing spreads through creation and, and we bear fruit that lasts. You might be annoyed actually to know um, that this is a community adventure. Um, take a look at the person next to you. Um, why not? You're in this together. Give the, let's encourage one another. Give them a high five, the person next to you. Say, there, do you know what? That shade of Jesus looks really good on you. That shade of Jesus, you know, it brings out the kindness in your eyes, and, uh, apart from the pink. <laughs> the Spirit is shaping Christ-likeness in, in all of us, in the people next to you, the people behind you, the people in front of you, and the people on Zoom and not quite here with us this morning. We're a city built on a hill. It cannot be hidden. Churches in our areas, we're to let our light shine before others and witness to the love and glory of our Father in heaven. Christ-like people make a Christ-like community, and a Christ-like community worships and serves. The Holy Spirit is working behind the scenes to, to prod and to prompt and to prune us to make all of this possible. So I hope that as we reach our final point, I really I hope that it's become clear to you that the community outreach work that we do and, and discipleship of Jesus, it's not done by might, it's not done by power, it's done by the Spirit of God. There's a reason that Jesus tells his disciples to wait until they're clothed with power from on high. With humans, building God's kingdom is impossible. With God, all things are possible. I hope that this is encouraging. Loving God and loving others it is not something that we do just by ourselves. And actually, this is good because it means that the success of the gospel, it doesn't depend on, on me or you or anyone else here this morning. But just because the success of the gospel doesn't depend on us, it, it doesn't mean that we can sit back and put the telly on and, and watch Man City win the Premier League until death do us part. Because that, that wouldn't be nice for anyone unless you're a City fan. We all have roles to play. We have a partnership with the Spirit to participate in, a community of Jesus' followers to witness with, and a world beyond the church's walls that, that doesn't know how desperate it is for the goodness and grace and mercy of God. You might have noticed, and, and this would be a fair complaint, um, that I haven't used any personal stories this morning. I've not used any particularly contemporary examples, and... and um, that would be a fair complaint, because how can we know that the Holy Spirit still works today in the ways that we've discussed? And so I'd like you to say that, that if that was a mistake, it was a deliberate mistake. Um, it's all part of my sneaky plan. I've used the biblical examples of the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, because the Bible tells us God's story, and we, you and I, are part of God's story. We have a place in God's story. I could have told you tales of the way that God has worked here and now in my life and in the lives of others. And Actually, in fact, if you're here this morning and you're following Jesus, then, then there we go. You yourself are one spectacular story of the work of God's Holy Spirit in our world. Well done. It's encouraging on one level to hear lots of personal stories because if God can work through me, then he can most certainly work through you. But here's the thing. God's stories are better than mine. And God's stories are paradigmatic. What God has done before, God can do again. And so my sneaky plan has been this, that, that as we hear this morning what God's Spirit can do, we're encouraged to join God on his mission. We've seen that God's Spirit breathes life, that God sets free, demands justice, binds broken hearts, inspires imagination, sculpts Christ-likeness, and empowers from on high. I hope that we'll leave this morning eager to, to participate with the Spirit so that we can see God do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. God is not done with us yet. Shall we pray? There. Invite the band to come up. Uh, I thought it could be good to uh, pray the first verse uh, of an ancient hymn. Um, 
with one or two lines added from me uh, at the end, because it's trendy nowadays to take a hymn and then add a, a modern twist to it. Um, I think it will come up on the screen. I actually can't remember. I think it's called Veni Creator Spiritus, but I can't remember if that's right. Um, anyway, uh, join in if you want. You might want to pray for a particular situation that you're kind of facing right now. You might just want to pray with an open mind, asking for God to inspire your imagination to see how he can build his kingdom here. Um, so here we go. Come, create a spirit. Visit the minds of those who are yours. Fill with heavenly grace the hearts that you have made. Stir us to worship and show your glory in Portobello. Clothe us with power from on high. Amen.